But just while we go to the PowerPoint, a couple of things. Number one, um, with the rear gate, I will continue to open that rear gate until further notice. So, um, it, you know, it wasn't just last week and the week before that it was open. That will continue to be the case uh, until, you know, we find out what's happening with the parking down here. Um, the other thing, of course, uh, Macquarie Electorship is underway and uh, today uh, we're finishing early and uh, with the aim of going over to that, there'll be lunch uh, and um, it's, it's fairly simple to get over there. So uh, again, we'd encourage you to be part of that. Um, we're still searching. Um, so we shall... Sorry? What's it called? Well, which, which baptism are you talking about? So, it was up to. So she got in the alphabet of war. Normal services will be resumed shortly. Them days. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, one of the um, things that we face in the English language is the question of whether the speaker understands his or her words in the same way as the hearer. Uh, understands those words. Because sometimes what I mean by a certain word may not be what somebody else understands by that word or phrase for that matter. For instance, I might say to somebody, I've got a bone to pick with you. And what that normally means in English is I've got a disagreement with you and I want to talk to you about it. Well, let's say that we're standing in a kitchen and we've just pulled a leg of lamb out of the oven, and I say to you, I've got a bone to pick with you, that might be a bit confusing, because you think, well, what, are we going to pull the lamb or, or something like that? So again, it is important that uh, the speaker uh, makes every effort to ensure that uh, the words that he's using or she's using is understood in the same way by those who are hearing. And that's very important too in matters of religion. And there are, even the word God might have multiple meanings to different people. But the word that I want to look at today is the word baptism. Because when we uh, look at the scriptures, we'll see that many times we're told to be baptized. It's a word that's used over and over again. And yet, it obviously has different meanings, not only in modern society, but in the Bible. For example, um, we can go over to Acts chapter 10, uh, and we'll come to these passages in a while, uh, but at Acts chapter 10, with Cornelius and those who were with him, we find that they were baptised in the Holy Spirit, and yet Peter afterwards says that they need to be baptised in water. So you've got two different baptisms that are being talked about there. Also, here in the passage that was just read in Acts 19, verses 1 to 7, Paul comes to the city of Ephesus and finds some people there who have been baptised. But when he talks to them, he finds they were baptised according to the baptism taught and practised by John the Baptist. And so they are baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. So between those two examples, there are actually three different baptisms. 
So when we say baptism is important and we need to be baptized, we need to clarify exactly what we're talking about there. So I want this morning to do a brief survey of the different forms of baptism and it is my plan, God willing, to come back again uh, later on and, and look at uh, certain aspects of uh, baptism in more detail. But right now, let's just look at some of the different baptisms. And we're going to start over in Matthew, the third chapter. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And in this case, we're looking, first of all, at the baptism of John the Baptist. Matthew 3 verse 1, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we go down to verse 5, At that time Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. That's John was baptizing them. He was baptizing them in water. And that was the way that it was being done at that time. Um, now, we know that later on, and I have talked about this previously, that um, the uh, baptism of John was outdated once Christianity was established. Because when we look at, for instance, Romans 6, which as I say we will do shortly, we find that baptism involves the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of those things are part of baptism. But when John was baptizing, those things hadn't yet occurred. So when we go over to uh, Acts chapter 17, where we were before, we find that uh, John, uh, John's baptism was pointing ahead to Jesus. Um, uh, Acts chapter 19 and verse 4, Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him, that is Jesus, who was coming after him. So that baptism looked ahead. But then, as I said, it became outdated once Jesus had died for our sins, been buried and been raised up, and Christianity was established. Indeed, we go back to uh, Acts chapter 18, and we find there in um, verse 25 that Apollos came to the city of Corinth, and Apollos was an outstanding preacher in various ways, but it says at the end of verse 25 that he was acquainted only with the baptism of John. And so he begins preaching and we read in Acts 18 and verse 26 that Priscilla and Aquila, husband and wife, took him aside and taught him the word, of, the way of God more accurately. He needed to understand that again the baptism of John the Baptist had been replaced. And so it was in Acts 19 that the people in Ephesus were baptized again, this time into Jesus Christ. So that is not a baptism that still applies for us today. So we go on and we have a look at another baptism. And once again, we go back to Matthew chapter 3. And this time we read from verse 11, and this is John the Baptist speaking. He says there, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit <coughs> uh, to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let's just focus on the Holy Spirit here. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And that's talking what Jesus was going to do. Now, there are two specific instances in the New Testament which are specifically connected to baptism in the Spirit. 
One is the case of the apostles, and for that we go over to Acts, the first chapter, and uh, we read here Jesus' words uh, just before he ascends to heaven. So Acts chapter 1, and uh, I'll begin in verse 4. Gathering them together, his disciples, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then we go over to chapter 2 and verse 1 of Acts. Uh, a few days have passed by. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Uh, Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and a tongue rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit was giving them ability to speak out. That is one instance specifically linked to baptism in the Spirit. The other example is over in Acts, the 10th chapter, with the case of Cornelius and those who were gathered with him. Peter teaches them. And we read in Acts 10 and verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And we've got Peter's own explanation of that over in Acts chapter 11. And I'll pick it up there in verse 15. Peter has gone back to Jerusalem and he's challenged about what has taken place. So he tells the people in Jerusalem about what happened with these Gentiles. In Acts 11 and verse 15, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave them, Cornelius and those with him, the same gift as he also gave to us, the apostles, after believing in the Lord Jesus, who was I that I should stand in God's way? So in that case, uh, Peter says, of oh, Cornelius and the others, they were baptized in the Spirit, and that was a confirmation of God's will, because up to that point, they hadn't been evangelizing Gentiles. Now, a couple of things about Holy Spirit baptism. Number one, it did not involve water. And number two, uh, it uh, did not involve the intervention of other human beings. Paul, Peter, and it could not baptize anybody in the Holy Spirit because nobody was involved in doing that. The Holy Spirit came directly upon someone. Now these are the two cases that are specified in the New Testament. It involves the apostles and it involves the first Gentile converts. Baptism in the Spirit is not for the forgiveness of sins or the washing away of sins as is the baptism, say, of Acts 2.38 or Acts 22 verse 16. And furthermore, baptism in the Spirit was not controlled by human beings. So baptism in the Spirit can't be the fulfillment of the Great Commission, for instance, where the apostles were sent out and were told to baptise people. You can't baptise people with the Spirit in the sense that we've read of here. So the baptism in the Spirit is not the baptism that we need to focus on today in regard to the matter of salvation. But let's come back to something else that is mentioned in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. This is the same verse, John the Baptist speaking, 
As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, what does that mean? He'll baptize you with fire. Well, you notice here it goes together with he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So maybe it's talking about baptism in the Spirit. And some might go back to Acts chapter 2 and say, well, Acts chapter 2 indicates that. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and rested on each one of them. So you say there's talk of fire in association with baptism in the Spirit. So uh, it appears that John perhaps was speaking of baptism in the Spirit and including the idea of fire with that. And we've got some problems there. Uh, one is that there in Acts 2 it doesn't say there was fire. It says that in the version that I'm reading from, tongues that looked like fire. Or some of your versions might have tongues as of fire. If you go over to Acts chapter 10, in the case of um, Cornelius, there's no mention of fire whatsoever. So it doesn't appear that baptizing with fire is the same as baptizing in the Spirit. But if you come back to Matthew chapter 3, the context, I think, gives us the meaning here. And I'll start back up in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. And this is talking of John the Baptist. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, the anger to come? Well, we then go down to verse 10, and this is still John speaking, and the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is being cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 11, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork, uh, that's used in threshing, is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The chaff is the unwanted part of the grain. So there's two things being talked about there as John uses agricultural illustrations. The proper grain will be retained but the rest, the unwanted uh, part, the useless part, will be burned up with fire. So it appears that when John talks about Jesus baptizing in the Spirit and fire, he's talking about two things there. On the one hand, there will be those who do receive the Spirit. But on the other hand, there will be those who face God's judgment. And that fits in with the context of Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 uh, down to um, verse um, 12 there. So we have baptism by fire, in other words, judgment, but nowhere are we commanded to be baptised by fire. So that brings us on to a, another passage and for that we go over to Mark chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. And if I'm going fast here, I apologise for that, as I say. I just want to give an overview today, and then we'll look more closely at different aspects of baptism in later lessons. But Mark chapter 10, verses 38 and 39 
It's Jesus speaking here, and he is speaking to two of his apostles, uh, James and John, who've asked a favour of him. And so, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptised with the baptism with which I am baptised? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink, and you shall be baptised with the baptism with which I am baptised. So they were going to be baptised with the same baptism as Jesus. And you think, well, okay, Jesus had been baptised earlier by John the Baptist. So was Jesus saying that they, his apostles, were also going to be baptised uh, by the baptism of John the Baptist? Well, that doesn't make sense because over in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was talking with his apostles, he distinguished the baptism that they were going to experience from the baptism of John the Baptist. Um, Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, I'll pick it up there. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, day, not many days from now. So uh, there, back in Mark chapter 10, Jesus wasn't saying you're going to be baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist, just like I am. Because he says later, no, they were going to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And furthermore, as we see over in Acts 18 and Acts 19, the baptism of John the Baptist became outdated. However, there was another baptism that Jesus said that he was going to go through. And that is over in Luke, the 12th chapter, and verse 50. Luke 12 and verse 50. This is Jesus speaking. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. And he's speaking future tense there. He's saying there's another baptism. He'd already been baptised earlier in the, uh, by John the Baptist. But he says, there's a baptism I still have to undergo. And he said he was distressed about that. What do you think he's talking about? It appears to be the suffering that was involved with his uh, crucifixion. The suffering that led up to that, the suffering that was part of it. And that's what Jesus is talking about, and he's saying to his apostles, you will experience the same baptism. What he's saying to them is, just as I will face suffering, so you will too. And indeed, they were going to uh, face suffering for the cause of Jesus, I'll just read uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. So Jesus was going to suffer, and his disciples were going to suffer as well. And that appears to be the baptism that he's talking about in Mark chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. He says, you're going to experience what I'm going to experience. Well, we keep going. You, you're seeing here, baptism comes up again and again. You know, in, in modern society, people say baptism is not important. You don't get that impression when you go through the New Testament because it is a subject that comes up repeatedly. But we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, and we find another baptism that is mentioned there. Paul here is writing to the church in the city of Corinth, and he says this to them, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, and that our fathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea, and they were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
what Paul is doing here is making an historical reference to an event that by this time had taken place about almost 1500 years earlier. He's talking about the time of the Exodus when Moses, uh, guided by God and empowered by God, led Israel out of Egypt and then led them through the Red Sea. And the cloud there, remember that God led them by a, a pillar, a cloud uh, by day and uh, fire by night. And it says here they were all baptized into Moses. Now nowhere in the New Testament you find a general command for all people to be baptized into Moses. This was a one-off historical event. And you think about what happens in regard to baptism. When people are baptized into Christ, as the Bible says, then what? They're united with Christ. They place themselves under Jesus' leadership. Well, when the Israelites were figuratively baptized into Moses at the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, they were firmly linked to Moses and indeed would remain under the leadership of Moses for as long as Moses continued to live, which was another 40 years thereabout. And they would be the followers of Moses. Moses would lead them. Moses, at the Red Sea, through God's power, delivered Israel from the pursuing Egyptian army, just as Jesus Christ delivered us from sin. So yes, there is a baptism into Moses, but as I said, that's a one-off historical event where baptism is used in a figurative sense. Let's go over another couple of pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. And you come here to a very difficult passage. Uh, many interpretations, explanations have been given for this passage, but it is difficult to know exactly what Paul was referring to. Again, he's writing to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, and Paul says, for otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? What's it mean? It's difficult to be sure of it. Does it mean, as at least one religious group thinks, that you can be baptized on behalf of your dead relatives? Is that the idea? Well, for reasons which I'll give in a moment, no. You can't be baptised on behalf of others, just as you can't have faith on behalf of others. You can't be saved on behalf of others. There's something to note here in verse 29. Paul distinguishes himself from those who are being baptised for the dead. You'll notice here, again verse 29, what will those do who are baptised for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptised for them? He doesn't say, why am I baptised for the dead? But he doesn't say, why are we baptised for the dead? He said, why are they baptised for the dead? So this was something that was not a universal practice, whatever it is that Paul is talking about there. And if you come over... Uh, in the Old Testament, to Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, you'll see that you can't be saved on behalf of others. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the person who sins will die. A son will not suffer for the father's guilt, nor will a father suffer for the son's guilt. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. That's in the Old Testament. You'll see a similar idea over in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 10. Again, each person taking responsibility for themselves. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with what he has done, <coughs> whether good or bad. So whatever Paul is talking about in regard to being baptised for the dead, he was not teaching this as a general practice of Christians being baptised on behalf of physically dead relatives. So that's not the baptism that we are taught uh, to engage in. So there we've got six different baptisms that are mentioned and they're not the baptisms for us. However, there is another baptism that itself is frequently referred to in the New Testament. You can't, as many are doing now, toss baptism aside. It's there too often in the scriptures. We come over to Romans chapter 6, and I'll read there from verses 1 to 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue uh, in sin so that grace may increase? Far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus have been baptised into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is free from sin. And that's connecting all of that to baptism. Baptism is linked to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just as he went through a death, burial, and resurrection, so it says here that we go through a death, burial, and resurrection. We die to our past life. We die to sin. We are buried with Christ and we're raised up to walk in newness of life. And that is a baptism that is taught many times. A baptism in water into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And I'll just read a few examples. For instance, we can go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says there uh, to the Jewish listeners, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or you can go over to Acts chapter 8, when Philip is with the Ethiopian who is reading from the book of Isaiah, and uh, uh, Philip, uh, sorry, um, Peter uh, explains things to him. No, I'm looking at the wrong chapter. That's what confused me. Really. Acts chapter 8, and it was Philip. Uh, we come to Acts 8 and verse 36. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered that the chariot stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So just as in Acts, the 10th chapter, this was a baptism in water. We can go over to Acts 22 and verse 16 where the Apostle Paul is recounting his own baptism from years earlier. And he talks about how Ananias had come to him at that time in Damascus. And in Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias asked, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and washed away your sins by calling on his name. Romans 6, which we looked at a, a while ago. Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus 
have been baptized into his death. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And I could continue there. There's many other examples. When we talk about the need to be baptised, this is the baptism that the Bible is speaking of. The baptism which is still relevant to us today. I said earlier, right at the start, that in talking to other people, we need to be sure that the way we understand certain words that we're using is the same way that people, our hearers, understand those words. Otherwise, we end at, at cross purposes. And that is very much true in regard to a discussion about baptism. When I talk about baptism, I mean one thing, does my does one listening to me understand the same baptism that I'm talking about? And sometimes we've got to ask to make sure that there is a common understanding there. We've seen here that the Bible talks about a variety of baptisms. The baptism taught and practiced by John the Baptist. The baptism in the Holy Spirit that is specifically applied in the cases of the apostles and of Cornelius and the Gentiles who were with him. There was the baptism in fire, which appears in the context to be referring to judgment. There is the baptism of suffering. The apostles would suffer just as Jesus suffered. There is the baptism into Moses, an historical event, that a, a once only event that occurred back in the time of the Exodus. There is the baptism for the dead. And certainly we cannot act on behalf of others when it comes to matters of salvation. When we go through the scriptures and we look at these various baptisms, we find that those are not the baptisms for us today. What we're told is that we need to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ in water for the forgiveness of sins. And that is a subject, again, that I want to look at in future lessons. But in the meantime, it's something for us to think about are we intent on doing what the scriptures want us to do have we been baptized do we understand what baptism is and have we been baptized according to the baptism which is relevant to us today it is there again and again and again we can't just toss it aside and say it's irrelevant. It's mentioned too many times to be ignored. We need to be true to the scriptures.